I'm going to present today what I did in the lectureship at Fish Hatcher Road in Huntsville yesterday. It was suggested by some here that were there, and we did have a very good turnout from spring that I do this because I was, as the other speakers in the same boat, had a hard time getting through all the material. My assignment actually was Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. There's a wealth of information there. I'll not be able to cover all that today. I was told yesterday, and it's been true of every lectureship I've ever participated in over the many years, that the hardest thing about them is to figure out what to leave out <laughs> and what, to, of course, to emphasize. Well, I had to leave out quite a bit, and I want to continue today. And I don't know, as I say, I, I know I won't get through all of it. But I hope, and this is a maybe, that I'll get through the first seven verses. But there's a strong chance I may not get through with about three of them. <laughs> I want to begin then with the section that would be verses 1 through 7. And since we're beginning where we are in this letter, we need to know that the Apostle Paul is still discussing the unity and especially the purity of the Lord's church. Remember, and I'll say this continuing to say it as I've had many times before, that these letters and most of them in the New Testament, most of the New Testament are letters written to individual Christians and to churches. And all of them have to do with this is what you need to do to be faithful. And this is the way we need to approach those letters, whether they're written to an individual like Timothy or Titus, or whether they're written to churches, whether it's a congregation or like Galatia, a number of congregations, we don't know how many, and realize that God had this put there because he wants Christians to remain faithful. So he is still discussing unity, but he's really emphasizing purity. I might point out that when you have the unity spoken of in Ephesians 4 and prior to that in the letter, that that unity is really worthless if you don't intend to be pure. It's not unity or purity or purity or unity. It's unity and purity. Unity, of course, has to do with the oneness of the church. And purity has to do with the life lived in it by each one who makes it up. This was introduced earlier in the letter. And in the verses we're beginning here, verse 1 of chapter 5, he's appealing now to the members to be, as he says, be ye followers of God as dear children. Now for this particular thought, we need to look at more particularly verse 1. And as I said yesterday, I don't normally, and those who hear me regularly know I don't do this a lot. I don't usually refer to the Greek. And especially if I do, it's usually just definitions to get a fuller understanding of what the English word means. But I will be referring to some of the grammar of Greek here, and so bear with me on that, and I'll try not to make that something that's more confusing than what I want it to be. That is, no confusion, but enlightenment. So I want us to note verse 1. And to me, and I emphasized this yesterday, this is the significant part of what he's going to say through what we have in the rest of chapter 5. There were no chapters and verses when this letter was written as there wasn't in any book of the Bible. Man put them in later on and uh, while they may have put chapters, especially verses in places they may have could have done better with, 
I'm glad it's there because I can tell you Ephesians 5 and you can find Ephesians and you can find chapter 5 and then you can look at verse 1 and so we want to look a little more at verse 1. The words, he says, be ye. Be you. You be. These are from the word, Greek word, geneste, which derives from genomai. And this is where I've mentioned the grammar part of it. Geneste is second person plural. Present, middle, imperative. Thus, it means you be. I read this and I realize he's talking to me. And he's saying you be, and then notice it's the... It's imperative language. I'm a member of the church, a Christian, the spiritual body of Christ, a family member, 1 Timothy 3.15, spiritual family of God. But he says you must be. You be is in the imperative. It means you must be. If heaven is to be your home, and you must have something like that on your mind, or you've never heard and believed the gospel and obeyed it, then here's what you must be in the church. It doesn't mean you can if you want to. It means you must. That's what imperative means, imperative language. It's not giving me a choice, and it's an urgent thing for you if you're going to be what God expects members of his family to be. And that's the significance of the word middle because it, it's aimed at me. And it tells me when I read the New Testament in general, I should realize this means me. I don't know how you're reading your New Testament from the standpoint of what you're thinking as you read it, but I've always tried to read it saying he's talking to David Brown. If I were the only Christian on earth, he's telling me I must be this way or heaven will not be your home. And it won't be your home because unless you're this way, you're not faithful. I suggest we keep in mind that we're to constantly check ourselves to see whether we are faithful. Examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. Well, he's helping us do that here by first of all saying when you approach this, know he's talking to you and your own responsibility in the church. And it must be. You can't get around it if heaven's to be your home. Now, the other word I want to observe is the Greek word mimetai. And it's from mimetes. And in the American Standard 1901, it translates it imitators rather than followers. Well, if you're a follower of somebody, you're imitating that person. Maybe imitator, and I didn't say this yesterday, might be a little stronger word. But it's the idea that you're trying to be just exactly what God wants you to be. And you're trying to imitate God. Now that's something. To imitate God. That's on our minds as His children. Have you ever noticed in family how the, a little boy up for at least a while will try to imitate his dad. Have you ever noticed the little girls trying to imitate their mothers? Have you ever seen the little girls start trying to put on their mama's shoes and try to do those things because they're looking at mama and they're following mama or they're imitating mama or in the case uh, little boys, their daddies. Uh, we can elaborate on that a long way to show why that God has the family unit and that they are father and mother exemplary 
to their kids and why there needs to be a father so that a little boy will know what it is to be a little boy and grow into a man like God wants him to be. And the same as far as a child that's a girl. Notice that it's what I'm told in reference to the words you be. Be what? I want to emphasize that further. Because I, I get the idea, and this is certainly brought out and caused to happen through a view of grace the Bible does not teach. You hear among a lot of folks, well, you can't be perfect anyway. You can't this, you can't that, and it pretty much says, well, you just dibble dabble a little bit in sin, not go overboard in any sin, and God's grace will take care of you. Because you see, there's nothing. You can do it all to save yourself anyway. Now apply that to this. Be ye. That's something you can do, but it's not only what you can do, you must do. And what is it? Imitate God. I only know how to imitate God when I know His will, and I only know His will from His words. So whoso continueth in the perfect law of liberty, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we're imitating deity. God made us to be able to imitate or follow deity. The word mimitase means to imitate. That's why the American Standard people, translators, did that. To imitate is to follow as an example. It's to strive to resemble somebody. And I can only imitate any man, get this point, I can only imitate any man in so far as that man imitates God. And Paul would say, and we may mention it later too, follow me as you see Christ living in me. Now from the places where this word is used, and there are many passages if you want to learn your references, and I'll pause to interject here what I did up there. Get your Vines Expository Dictionary New Testament words, and if you know how to use an English dictionary, you can use it and get some benefit from the Greek language as to uh, what it more particularly means. You've got in English what God wants you to do if it's a true translation, in the case of the New Testament, from the Greek to English. But I've often described it like this. Some of us grew up on black and white television. Then color television came along. And that's what's out there all over the place today. I've noticed some of the younger people when they watch some of the old movies, they don't like it because it's in black and white. Well, from a black and white movie, you get all there is to the movie as far as what's going on and so forth. Well, then why do we want a color one? Because you see things in the color of it you didn't see in the other. It doesn't change the storyline. It doesn't change much of anything other than you see the thing more as it is really is and just how certain things happen now you can carry that a little further when it comes to looking up a Greek word because it may be a little different from an English word because you can't translate in most cases a Greek word into a word one word in English sometimes it takes several words in English to try to say what they could say in one Greek word it's the nature of the way that the words are built in Greek and the way we do things in English. So it takes quite a bit of learning to be able to translate from England, uh, English to Greek or Greek to English. I, <laughs> I never mind trying to, although it wasn't necessarily easy, but I never mind trying to do what I was assigned to translate from Greek into English because you kind of have a cheater if you're familiar with the English verse. You kind of have something guiding you along. But try translating from English back into Greek and see how that works. 
I talked to a fellow who was taking uh, graduate Greek courses of the University of Texas. And the fellow they had teaching them in the graduate level was quite a scholar. And the way they did, since there was only about two or three of them, I think only two in the class, they just met in his office and they simply read from the Greek New Testament. And he would guide them and tell them why and he'd make mistakes and grammar or whatever. But I never will forget one of the fellows telling me because he was a gospel preacher. He said we kind of had one up on him because while he knew more Greek than we ever would know as a scholar in it and knew several other languages, he said we were so familiar with the Bible that when we started things, we could almost quote it back to him. And he didn't know whether we were... <laughs> translating it or not so there is a benefit but it never hurts us to stretch our minds a little bit you know I go over here and do this uh, exercise as best I can as, as much as I can six days a week and I, I watch some of those guys that I don't John was it you yesterday that said they had muscles on top of muscles well there's some over there like that and I see them grunt and growl and strain and try to lift more. And I keep saying, you're going to be so tough that by the time you die, the worms won't be able to chew you up. Well, that's what's going to happen with all of them, you know. It makes, they, as Paul said, bodily exercise profits little. Well, I don't doubt that. But now, of what long term, real long term worth is all of that? And I'm not against it. I'm just saying you're going to die. I don't care how you exercise, how big your muscles are. And you don't know how, you're going, how long you're going to live. Well, why can't we have that attitude toward stretching our minds? Toward doing something that makes us have to exercise our thinking a little more. So that's one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing today. But we're to imitate God. How do we do that? We imitate Christ. Remember our name, our proper name as a member of the church is Christian. I've said it many times, you've heard me say it, it means of Christ. Paul is saying, you be what I'm about to write by following or imitating Christ. Christ lived his life imitating his father. Imitating that which is perfect good. What we're seeing here is Christianity in action when we see a faithful member of the church doing what Paul said. Be ye followers or imitators of God. And then notice you do it as dear children. It's not something he's compelling you to do because you don't want to do it. After all, you've heard the gospel. It created belief in you as you understood it. Such a belief that led you to obey the command to repent, Acts 17.30, and all that that implies, and to confess your faith in Christ, and to complete your obedience to the gospel, being baptized into Christ for the remission of sin. These folks are in Christ. Now he's saying, you want to grow to be full man in Christ, mature? Then you've got to be this way. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's Christianity in action. It's seen by us being light of the world. God expects us to. Wouldn't it be something if somebody stood here and said, well, you can just go ahead and live like the world and that'll be all right. Well, the Bible's full of material. It says, no, as you follow the truth, as you put it into action, as dear children, then you show forth the light of truth in your influence in the world. Salt of the earth. Jesus said that's what we are. Well, salt preserves. You know, I hear, and rightly so, when I do the same thing, pray for this country. Pray that the church will have peace. That implies what all it takes for the church to have peace. 
and that the gospel will have free course. Those are words used by the New Testament as to what we should pray for. And that implies laws rely to have free, free course. But I want you to think about this. I don't know that we realize that. Salt preserves. Do you as a Christian ever think about yourself in this life in being around others and the influence that you have by your life, what you do and don't do, and in your family as a preservative? How do we know but that God is causing the United States to stay even where it is with all the trouble there is in spiritual things and moral things simply because of the preserving power of the Lord's church? Leaven is used either to leaven for good or leaven for bad. But it has to do with leavening for good. How do we know as preservatives that we are not leavening the whole of this country for good? How? Because we love the truth. Because we know it's imperative that we follow or imitate God. And then, of course, you have the letters themselves. We are the epistles known and read of all men. I, I wish I could appreciate, and I've tried to all my life, but especially the whole church, to realize how we rub off, as it were, on other people. And we'll never know many times that we made an impact on somebody. For good but if we do evil we never know just how far it goes for bad so it's power in our conduct we are the epistles some people read therefore from verse 1 I can hear Paul originally saying to our brethren of long ago in the church at Ephesus, challenging me along with them and everybody else that is a child of God, presenting to me the challenge of a lifetime. Do you have the wherewithal to accept that challenge? I think it was last week, I don't remember for sure, that I said when I was a younger preacher and spoke a lot at youth get-togethers, that I would say to the young people, so you think there's nothing to Christianity, it's no big deal. And I've seen a lot of members live that way. Well, now you think about this. It's imperative that you imitate God or you won't be faithful and hell will be your eternal destiny. Is that a challenge? When you set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth, that is on things God wants you to be doing while you're here to prepare you for heaven, that's a, a big challenge. When you start trying to say, well, I'm going to make sure I study my Bible daily and I'm going to be in a place where I can think about what I'm studying and I can meditate on it. And we sang the song in a moment ago about praying in the morning, noon, and evening, which basically saying be regular and steadfast in prayer, which means you have to learn from the Word of God how to pray. And the attitude that says in things, not my will, but thine be done. All those things and multiplicity of details is telling us how to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. And he's telling us here, here's where you start, and you've got to do it. There are a lot of people that if God made it possible for me to be baptized as a proxy for them, I'd be glad to do it. Because I want to see as many people as possible go to heaven. Many a parent would be glad to obey the gospel for their children. But you know, none of that's possible 
A person must reach a stage of maturity to where they know by their lives if they died now, they would lose their soul in a devil's hell and there's no coming back. And they know the only way is through Christ and his gospel and thus they respond to the gospel invitation and in obedience to it. And that same thing is being brought out here. Now that you're dear children, you be this. And it's in the imperative in the Greek. You must be this. What would you think about somebody being given a medical degree so they can experiment on you when you come to the doctor's office? And they had gotten an F when it came to their knowledge of the physical anatomy. But you're going to have a fellow like that do surgery on you. You'd think that'd be crazy. It would be worse than crazy. <laughs> and if we knew what was going on, it had some power over it, we wouldn't allow it. Well, think about that when it comes to the imperative that's set out here that we must believe and do if heaven is to be our home. What he's saying is, is that going to heaven is conditional. It's conditional to become a Christian. Conditions are laid out by God in order to become a Christian, which we must meet. And now that you become a Christian as dear children, members of the church, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, Members of the body of Christ, the Lord added you to the church when you from the heart obeyed the gospel and was baptized into Christ for the rest of sins. Now, as a child yearning to grow and be like God, that's what you must do is be an imitator of God. But you're as dear children. What does that imply? God loves me. How much do you love your children? How much does God love us? Well, all you have to do is look to Christ Jesus our Lord and you see for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How much did God love us? He gave his son. And the son, like Isaac of old when God commanded Abraham to offer him, he was willing to come, read Philippians. And you'll see he didn't consider it to be a th the glory and majesty, the form of deity, to be a thing to be held on to. But if this is what it takes to save them, I'm ready to go. Do we have that attitude in the spiritual body of Christ? We're his hands. We're his feet. We're his mouth. The commission to spread the gospel of the whole world is on your shoulders, if you're a member of the church, and on mine. Wherever we are, we're to be an influence for good. Now, considering, and I'm not going to get as far as I said I might, so you're going to get some of this for a while to come, the Lord willing. From verse 1, I find the way that this is to be accomplished. Remember, the imperative language is already set. I'm told to be an imitator of God, a follower of God as dear children. Now, I want to finish up today on that word love that I've been talking about for a moment. The word beloved is from the Greek word agapeta, and it's traced back to one we're more familiar with, uh, agapao, which is the noun form of agape. It's the highest form of love, and the Greeks had different words for love, because it always means uh, you're seeking another's highest good. And it's not just an, an emotional thing. It also is anchored in causing a person to pay attention to the truth or the message that's laid down, and that's the way we understand <clears throat> the conditions of God for us to meet, it's imperative that we meet them, all set out in the Word of God. So we must 
have this love, what Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So it describes the attitude of God toward his son. That's why I quoted John 3.16. But you can find the same idea in John 17.26. It's actually applied to all mankind in John 3.16. Mankind in general. It can be applied to those who are just believers in Christ or Christians, John 14, 21. But the agape, agapao love that's used here, beloved, form of agape, is one that said God seeks your highest good, your dear children. You've now benefited from having your former sins, your alien sins washed away. Because you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin. Now notice, you became the servants of righteousness. It's that becoming the servants of righteousness where Paul is in this passage when he says, you be these things, and it's imperative that you be these things. You must if you're to be faithful, and that's the way to heaven is to be faithful. Christians are children of God then through love. That's what John talks about. And we read it in 1 John 3, 1 through part of verse 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. For this cause the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we children of God. God. Again, 1 John 3, verse 1, first part of verse 2. We have been, as the scripture says, created after God. And this is, we haven't got time to go back through that, but that's clearly set out in the chapter just before this, beginning in verse 17 of chapter 4, going through verse 24. God made us what we are as Christians, but he didn't do it without our cooperation. What does that mean? A willingness on our part to let him have his way with us and quit trying to go about establishing our own stubborn will. We acquiesce. And I'm going to close on this part. We don't think about it enough, but when you see somebody being baptized into Christ, have you noticed that it is a passive thing on the part of the one being baptized? Now, whose gospel is being obeyed when one is immersed in water? Notice, by the authority of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which means into a saved relationship with those three. Why, it's Christ literally who's baptizing us. When you say, the work of God on earth, who's doing that work but the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular? The gospel is to be taught to everybody. The gospel is the power of God to save. And so it is, Romans 1, 16. But who is charged with the gospel preached to every creature? The angel's not going to do it. Jesus won't do it directly. We're in cooperation with him and he has commissioned us. And it's our imperative upon us to wherever we are, according to our several opportunities and ability, to teach the truth so people can know to come out of the sins they're in and become children of God. So we need to imitate him. Thus we have to have his characteristics. Christ is being formed in us when we imitate him. And there must be that idea of it's obligatory upon me to imitate him because I am a member of his spiritual body. But like as he who called you is holy, be yourselves. There's another be. Be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. Even... Matthew 5, 48 teaches the same thought when it says, Ye therefore shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So when a person realizes how he has been so loved, John 3, 
verse 16 and what we see here in verse 1, you're imitating God as dear children. Then it's easy, easier to walk as the beloved child of the Most High. And if you don't, if you're not a Christian, if you're outside the spiritual body of Christ, and the book of Ephesians starts off in verse 3 of chapter 1 saying all spiritual blessings are located in Christ Jesus. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places. If you're outside of Christ, you don't have all those spiritual blessings. Forgiveness of sins being one of them. Being a child of God being one of them. To benefit from all that God has to offer man to get him from earth to heaven. You must become a Christian. You must become one of the beloved. You must enjoy these things with an attitude that you're going to do His will, let come what may. Now that'll make even more sense out of why John wrote what Jesus wanted him to write in Revelation 2.10. Be thou faithful unto death and you'll receive a crown of life. Unto means if you must die rather than uh, give up the truth, die and you'll receive a crown of life. Stephen's the prime example of that as the first Christian martyr. If you're not a child of God, you'll notice we have said a lot about that, but it's been addressed to those who are members of the church and their obligations to be ye imperative, imitators or followers of Christ as dear children. But you may not be a child of God. You're standing outside of the beloved. People love you. They're praying for you. They're hoping you'll see the need of obeying the gospel. Or if you're a child of God and you've let what we said here today slip, then there's not really any difference in you than people out here that don't even know how to spell Bible. And you need to repent of sins. Turn from those ways and be imitators of God as dear children by repentance and confession of sin and once again walking in straight and narrow way. If you're subject to the blessed call of Christ, while time yet continues, will you respond while we stand and sing?